What's up everybody? I'm extremely happy to be making this video today. Why? This video is my first uh, review of another content provider on YouTube. And for those of you that don't know, there is a gentleman by the name of Tom. He goes by on YouTube and his other social media as Eat Sleep Dream English. A while back, he did a video on 11 different English accents around the world. And I found the video very, very interesting. So what I did was, is I contacted Tom. I said, hey, Tom, listen, I saw your video. Is it okay if I do a review on it? He said, yes. So, Tom, if you're watching this video, thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me to do a review of your video. So in this video, listen, you're going to hear 11 different accents around the world. And what I'm going to do is, is watch the video in its entirety. It might be a little, uh, or actually it might be a longer video than I typically do, but watch the video until its end. And I'm gonna make some general comments in terms of what I thought about the video and what I observed, all right? So, without further ado, let's watch the video. When you think of an English accent, what do you think of? This? I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. Ah, the Queen's English, spoken by pretty much just the Queen. English doesn't just belong to the Queen, it belongs to anyone that speaks it. Now, accents are a wonderful part of language and they can vary so much. Someone's accent can depend on where they're from, their socioeconomic background, their age, their race or ethnicity, their cultural influences, and so much more. All right, now did you hear what Tom said? He said English is spoken and English is owned by whoever owns the language. Did you catch it? That means it includes you. And also, did you hear what he said about accent, about how your accent is the distinctive way in which you speak English and shaped by many different factors, such as your culture, your race, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic levels? Did you hear that? Now, if you don't believe me, because I believe that I've said that on previous content, if you don't believe me, believe Tom, all right? So what is he saying? What am I saying? Accent is the distinctive way in which you speak. You, 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 you. So be proud of who you are. Hey there, I'm Emma from the mm English YouTube channel. I'm also from Australia. And here we don't have the regional dialects that are so prominent in the UK and the US. It's actually quite hard to pick from where within Australia an Australian is from. There is definitely a more pronounced posh Australian accent and a more broad um, ochre Australian accent, which is the one that you'll recognize from movies and, and it's always poorly done by non-Australian English speakers. But that difference uh, in those two accents or dialects is not really based on geography, it's more based on social circles and culture. All right, I've got three pronunciation features of the Australian accent to share. One we share in common with British English, the other with American English, and one is distinctly Australian. I'll let you guess which one is which. But first up, we don't pronounce the er, r sound at the end of words, like teacher, blister, weather. So that final sound is a schwa, the er is silent. Unless the word following starts with a vowel and then the er sound becomes a linking sound. Power up becomes power up, power up. Second, we usually use the flap T between vowels and that means that the T sound sounds more like a D. Water, butter, leather, got it? Now, the Australian accent is really defined by its vowels and it's often referred to as a drawl. It's not the most flattering of, of words or pronunciation types at all. But most distinct, I think, is the 
O vowel sound, the diphthong sound, O. This is the sound that I can detect in any of my non-native speaking English students. Um, I can hear that O if they've spent any time in Australia. Um, and you can hear it in really, really common words like go, soap, though, so often, right? But it's distinctly Australian, that pronunciation. So if you would like to hear more Australian English pronunciation or learn a little bit more about it, check out the mm English YouTube channel. See you there. Hello, my name is Kayla, or I'm also known as Teacher K from Diaspora English Learning. And what you're hearing right now is a Canadian accent. Actually, it is one of many Canadian accents because people sound different in different parts of the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast to the Prairies to Quebec and Ontario. And even within cities, you will hear a lot of variety in people's accents and their way of speaking English because Canada and Canadians are extremely multilingual and multicultural. So depending on a person's linguistic or cultural background, their variety of English may differ a little bit. But there are some aspects of English in Canada that span across all the varieties and that are unique to Canada. My accent specifically is from the greater Toronto area. Notice that I said Toronto and not Toronto. That's a feature of Canadian English. We, for T's that are not stressed, they end up sounding more like an N. Like for example, 20 instead of 20, Toronto instead of Toronto, and enter instead of enter. Okay, this is a feature. Another thing that's unique to Canadian English is the way we say our vowels. We rarely say our vowels in the back of our throat. A lot of times it's more nasal compared to American varieties of English. For example, Canadians say sorry and Americans say sorry. It's a small difference, but it's something that makes Canadians stand out. The way we pronounce the vowel A in some words is also different from, um, is also different. For example, in Canada, we say pasta instead of pasta, mantra instead of mantra, for example. And last but not least, we have this word A that we use as a question tag, as an interjection, um, in between, co after comments and exclamations. This, you will hear all over the country, this word A. Hey guys, I'm Catherine. I'm a Canadian living in London, UK. I was born in China and my first language is French. So I'm here to talk to you about the French Canadian English accent. You might have come across someone. They will sound, let's say, North American, a bit like me right now, but there's something else behind. You might be tempted to say French, but uh, they don't sound like the French from France, correct? That's because they might be from Quebec province, which is on the eastern coast of Canada. French is the official language of Quebec. Put simply, it goes back to when New France was the area colonized by France in North America, and then under the British rule, Quebec French got isolated from European French, and both languages' phonetics and speech patterns evolved differently. Quebec is home to 8 million people, and French is the native tongue for 78% of the population, so that will often influence our accent. Let's explore some of the common features to recognize it. Let's actually have a look with one of our greatest ambassadors, Céline Dion, or Céline Dion. And the makeup, and the jewelry, and the clothing that I love so much, and, and pretending, and like dramatic, and oh my goodness, oh, oh, oh. I love all that. And I really wanted to show as well, you know, we borrow um, characters, mm. we're on stage. So her accent is not that prominent, but in some words, her consonant sounds are stronger. Jewelry. Jewelry. Like dramatic. Dramatic. Borrow. Borrow. That strong R sound, right? Right? Let's have a look at another shirt example. You've been married, what, 20 years now, Dorene? Hey, 20 years? My husband, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you notice she said husband instead of husband? It's actually been really tough to find a video of her with that feature because, you know, she's been singing My Heart Will Go On for ages now. 
but this is actually super common for us French Canadians. The H sound alone is silent in French, so we often just drop it in English, and it will lead to things like hello, hot, happy, history. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed、um, this overview of French Canadian English. So I'm Diane, and I'm going to talk to you about the Irish accent. Well. Okay, no, that's kind of wrong. Right out the gates, there is no one Irish accent. In fact, Ireland has the most accents per capita of anywhere in the world. From one side of the city to the other, you'll find two completely different accents. Take Dublin, for example. I have a South Dublin accent because I'm from the south side of Dublin. On the north side of Dublin, you'll find people have a much thicker accent. For example, Colin Farrell is from the north side of Dublin, and his accent is just a wee bit thicker. And who gets into hell and all that? The Irish accent is more commonly referred to as a brogue, and it's probably the accent people most complain about people getting wrong in films. I'm going to say that. That's because they attempt to do an Irish accent, and they don't pick a specific place. If they were, a good place to start might be one of the four provinces: Leinster, Ulster, Munster, and Connacht. Now, each of those provinces have hundreds of different accents among them, but they share commonalities. Within them, for example, take your classic Northern Irish Belfast accent. While I, from the capital city, might say "cow," "now," "how." In Northern Ireland, they use a much smaller mouth and they go "kai," "nai," "hi." But say you fly across to the west of Ireland, you will find Cork, which has a completely different accent altogether. Very sing-songy, very charming. What I'm getting at is, we all sound completely different wherever you are, but there are a few things we have in common. Let's go back to the words YouTube word. Is that one word or two words? It's a hyphen. It. No, it's not. So while I'm aware the correct pronunciation of YouTube is you. Tube in Ireland we say tube. You tube. The biggest thing you'll notice about Irish people is that we often get rid of our ths. For example, the word three. You might hear us say tree. Some of us actually are saying the th, but we're saying it so quickly and lightly that you can barely hear it. One, two, three. We like to drop the ends of words. We're quite lazy. Walking, talking, thinking, and then there's the letter or. We say or very pronounced or r, depending on where you are in the world. R, butter. When it comes to vowels, we tend to soften those. So while maybe you should say how are you, I would just say how are you. And of course, we are accused frequently of speaking very fast, but that's a matter of opinion. I think it's just because we have a lot of slang terms that people outside of Ireland might not be familiar with. And of course, I couldn't do this video without mentioning the word potato. Yeah, potato. And that's the Irish accent. If you want to know more about slang terms and Irish accents and all things Irish, check out my YouTube channel, Diane Jennings. Bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Trav Neil. I am a Singaporean Chinese actor and yoga teacher based in London. So I'm here to talk to you about the Singaporean accent today, leaving aside what Singlish is, which is a whole new different topic. So the Singaporean accent, we tend to extend the last vowel of the words that we are saying in a sentence, and we tend to put pauses in between a lot of different words for no reason because. It's just how the way we speak. I think it has a lot of influence from Chinese and how it's like. And maybe sometimes when we are speaking,、uh, we are some of us are translating from Chinese to English in our head, so creating a lot of random pauses here and there.、Uh, that's how we speak. And also, we don't really have ths in our English, so we don't say father, mother. We say father, mother, sister.、Uh, yeah, and. I mean, there are many different types of Singaporean accent, anyways. So sometimes some people would sound a little bit more American if they want to seem like they've went to a really nice posh school with American teachers, or you know, sometimes、um, they have a little bit of Malay accent or Indian accent or Chinese accent influenced in the way they speak. So if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me a message on Instagram. And my handle is at Travneil. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye. Hey, eat, sleep, dream, English fans. This is Rosie from the YouTube channel Not Even French.、Uh, I make videos about the French culture and also the Kiwi culture or the New Zealand culture as well. So, a little bit about the New Zealand accent. Couple of fun facts. So. 
I think a lot of people would say that the Australian accents and New Zealand accents sound very similar, but we can definitely tell the difference, kind of like uh, Canadians and Americans. To us, the Australian accent sounds a lot stronger, a bit more drawly, um, and you can definitely tell the difference when they say words like good or cool. They really tend to uh, drag out the O's a little bit. I think they tease New Zealanders a little bit about our accent because our vowels are a bit strange. So uh, if you say, for example, red, like the color, so not blue, but red, and uh, a pen, as in what you write with, and you ask your friend, hey, can I borrow your red pen? Um, to a lot of people, that would sound like uh, a red pin, you know, something you put on the wall um, to to pin a poster up or something like that. So red pin, um, fish and chips. So red pen is a classic. Another one that we get relentlessly teased about is when we say dick, as in, you know, the, the wood outside, you know, your house where you have a table and a barbecue, we would say, hey, do you wanna go outside on the deck or how's your new deck coming along? And of course that sounds a little bit like D-I-C-K. Um, so, I think, you know, our E's sound like I's and sometimes our I's can sound like U's. For example, fish and chips. I really feel like fish and chips tonight. Um, sounds a little bit like chops. <laughs> I think as well, something that's interesting about the New Zealand accent is that it's pretty standard across the entire nation. It's not like, you know, in Ireland, for example, whether you're, if you're in Cork or Limerick, you have completely different accents, right? In New Zealand, we have a very standard New Zealand accent. Uh, the only sort of tweaks to that may be in the South Island in some pockets, there's an R sound that almost rolls at the R, um, but that would be quite hard for even a New Zealander to pick up on. And then the other influence would be very rural New Zealand, um, sometimes in the farming community. The accent somehow seems a little bit stronger. It's almost verging on a, an Australian accent from the city. So a lighter Australian accent may be a kind of stronger New Zealand accent, a bit, I would call it like a blokey accent. Another influence, of course, on the New Zealand accent is Te Reo Māori, which is the Māori language from our indigenous people here in New Zealand. And that culture has influenced the way we speak every day as well. So for example, uh, they use the words cuz and bro. Um, if you were saying something is so true, you could say like hard out bro, that's so true, hard out. You know, things like that that you'd hear in New Zealand that you wouldn't hear in the UK or Australia, for example. Another example is another way of kind of saying like, oh, awesome, or whoa, would be saying, oh, too much. Like that's awesome, too much. And that comes from the Maldi culture that say too Mickey. So yeah, there's, there's little things like that as well, which are very only in New Zealand. On that point as well, the Maldi culture is coming into New Zealand English a lot more. So to say hello, you could say kia ora. And of course, Te Reo Maldi is coming more and more into New Zealand English. And so just instead of saying like, hello, you could say kia ora, and that would be a really normal thing to hear. Also, instead of saying well done, you might say ka pai. Instead of saying let's have a meeting, you'd say you'd have a hui. And so you'll see that more and more as well, which is very cool. Ka pai, if you will. If you want to see me in action going through literally hundreds of slang terms unique to New Zealand, definitely check out the links down below. I'll give some videos to Tom and I hope that you enjoy them. See you later. Ka kite. My name is Deepika and I'm an English teacher from India. I run the account Acquiring on Instagram and I talk about um, global English and English as a lingua franca and I bust some myths about native speakerism all while teaching you how you can acquire the best version of your existing English. And today I wanted to share a little bit about the English language, the English variety in India. So English came to India in the 1600s um, through the British, of course. And it was around the 1830s that they started to incorporate um, 
English instruction in schools. So it was made mandatory in some parts of the country um, for children to learn English in schools while the adults who are working in the government were um, starting to use English um, for, you know, day-to-day -day government activities. And through that, of course, English spread. And now in a lot of major areas in India, now in 2021, um, English is a lingua franca which means that English is the language that is used as a transaction language between people who don't speak the same language. And English is also used, um, widely used as a, a, a medium of instruction in schools. And, and you might know that India is a multilingual, multicultural country, and we have 22 official languages. And English is not one of them, but English is considered the associate language because it's used, like I said, as a lingua franca, not only in day-to-day -day activities, but also in government, even when it comes down to the central government interacting with the state governments, English is the one they uh, go for. Um, that being said, you might be under the impression that English is widely spoken in India. Um, I used to think that too, to be honest. I'm from India and I used to think that, but you will be surprised to know that only about 15, one, five, 15% of Indians speak English. Yep. And only like about 1%, so less than 1% even, speak English as a native language. So there's quite a bit of disparity between what the world thinks um, what even us Indians think and what is the reality of English in India. That said, um, in English has evolved into its own thing in India. So Indian English is a legitimate variety of the English language and it's because what is called contact linguistics. English interacting with all of the different languages in India. I said there are 22 uh, official languages there's about 700 actual languages in the country and so English interacts with many of them and forms these little um, quirks, these um, intricacies and nuances of its own kind. So Indian English is its own thing and I thought I'd share a couple of different things about uh, what makes Indian English unique and, and if you see someone out in the wild speaking English uh, I'll give you a couple of things that you can look out for um, to say if you know if you if that person is speaking Indian English so one of them is uh, let's start with vowels right one of them is how Indians say um, some of the diphthongs so diphthongs are double sound vowels and, and I'm thinking of words like don't, right? Don't, do not becomes don't, and the sound is o, o. But in most Indian English dialects, now Indian English, again, I can't talk about it as one whole thing. I can't just say all Indian in English speakers speak like this, because again, Indian English speakers are speakers of a variety of different languages, and all of these languages influence English in different ways. So these are some generic ones and there's definitely more nuanced, more specific ones in different regions. But this diphthong, don't, o, oh, um, becomes a monothong, a single word, um, a single sound. So you might hear don't. Instead of don't, you might hear don't. Or instead of a, a, the diphthong, a, you might hear a, a, uh, or a, a, like for example, eight. The past tense of eat would sound like eight. Uh, when in fact in other Englishes, you might hear eight. I ate breakfast, like the number eight. I ate breakfast. Versus in Indian English, you might hear I ate breakfast. You might have noticed that when some speakers of English say some sounds, you can hear or feel a puff of air coming out from their mouth. So uh, things like test, I'm taking a test, take a test, test. Can you feel the t, t? So in a lot of Indian English varieties or a lot of Indian English speakers, they don't make that puff of air. In Indian English, in a, a lot of varieties of English, Indian English, uh, you might hear test versus test, test, 
test 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 so you feel the difference in the puff of air it's missing in a lot of indian english varieties um, same with the the sound with p um, so if i think of pest right test pest again pest you might hear pest 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 these are just the tip of the iceberg as they say uh, there are a lot of things influencing what kind of english people speak in india what language you grew up speaking at home what language uh, was spoken around you in in the city or the town or the village you grew up in what language was taught to you in school whether you learn english in school or not there's a lot of not just linguistics but also politics and social class at play that determine how good your english is or what variety of indian english you speak so hopefully that's a good summary of the indian variety of the english language it's important for us to know that english is not one big mass right english is not a monolith english is fluid as all languages are but english ex especially is fluid and it's constantly evolving and it's used by so many people that english has as many varieties as there are speakers of english i would argue right uh, and so for us as english learners and english users it's important for us to know that english needs to be seen as that not as a monolith but as something that's constantly evolving something that um needs to be used as something to unite us rather than to divide us so english as a lingua franca or global english is the new norm or should be the new norm um hopefully that helps uh enjoy your english learning journey hey everybody my name is teacher will i am from the united states of america i grew up in a state called new jersey now within new jersey we have many different accents i spent most of my life in a town called marstown so if you watch my content you sometimes will hear me speak with a north jersey accent now characteristics of a north jersey accent for example Ah. With a Jersey accent from the north, we don't say ah, it becomes more oh. So, for example, more, thought, coffee, often. And notice with the often, we pronounce the T. Another example of a northern Jersey accent, we sometimes pronounce the R at the end of our words. As an example, care, player, where. Where are you going? Do you care about me? Those are characteristics that you might hear with respect to a North Jersey accent. At the end of the day, here's what I want you to re remember. Accents are the distinctive way in which you speak. And you will hear different accents around the world. Why? Because English is a global international language. Are accents important? Sure. But what's more important to me is clarity pronunciation, enunciation, and intonation. Why do I say that? Because at the end of the day, regardless if you're of your accent, if you're not clear and you don't pronounce words, it doesn't matter what accent you have, people won't understand you. So if you care and you want to, feel free to follow me on ask underscore teacher will. Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Leon, I'm a Los Angeles native speaker. I'm gonna be talking about Los Angeles accent because that's where I'm from. Uh, of course, there are 30 major dialects in the United States and uh, Cali, you know, Cali representing, you know what I mean, repping. Uh, we really don't pronounce the T's. T's are silent. So uh, other states pronounce the T's. Uh, they're both correct. So, for example, uh, mountain, we say mountain or tent, we say tent or that, we say that or thought, we say thought. So this is pretty much in general. Uh, of course, there's a regular accent in Cali or LA. Then there's a surfer accent. Then there's a Cholo, or Chicano, or Latino gangsta accent. Again, these are all natives. Uh, then you have the Valley Girl or Valley accent, which is kind of like a 1980s, you know, that's pretty much outdated. Uh, nobody really talks like that. You may find one or two people, but that's pretty rare. Uh, then there's a Rapster or Black African-American gangster accent. Uh, this is pretty much a brief general Los Angeles accent. 
I'm sure there's others, but this kind of gives you an idea in the general. Um, as far as finding me, you can find me at, uh, or my 411 handle is uh, English Teacher Leon. I'm on Instagram, so you can find me there. Hopefully you like this, so see y'all later. Ciao. Hi, I'm Tanya Suarez, and I'm an American Business English Coach. And I'm here to tell you a couple of features of the American English accent. Okay, so my favorite thing to work on that I teach all the time are connected speech patterns. And there's, you know, there are a lot of different categories, but I'm going to teach you a few today that will help you not only recognize the American accent, but also speak American English in a way that's a lot more natural and fluid. Okay, so the first thing is linking and blending. I love these. So for linking, this is part of connected speech where you take the, for example, a consonant and a vowel. You take, if a word ends in a consonant and the next word begins with a vowel, you link the sound. I'll be honest, this basically means like you don't really pause in between them, but then there's also a rhythm that links it. For example, we need to pitch it to the client tomorrow. So we have pitch that ends in ch, the ch sound, and it that starts with the i vowel sound. So instead of we need to pitch it, you're not gonna finish that air at the end of pitch. You're going to connect the ch to the i, chit. So we need to pitch it, pitch it to the client tomorrow. So this is where an entire like pause is reduced and it also changes your intonation because you're linking it so instead of just pitch it's pitch it pitch it another example would be how are you feeling about the merger so how are which this is great for example how are you so how are we end how with the w consonant sound and then we start it with r with the a vowel sound so you know that you can link it so how are war instead of how are how are how are you feeling how are you feeling about the merger so these are moments where linking really helps you feel like your english is smoother if you're learning the american accent and if not it helps you at least with comprehension and with your listening thank you so much for being interested in the american accent and i hope that these tips help you feel more confident and comfortable with americans Hello, my name is Chloe and I am from South Africa and I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about the South African accent. <laughs> so there's a couple of points of context that I have to give before I can talk about any examples of features from the South African accent. And the first thing is that um, South Africa is a country with a complex history, a lot of different kinds of people. Uh, and 11 official languages uh, official, and many more are spoken. So it is a very rich area linguistically. Um, and what it means is that to say someone has a South African accent, you're really only referring to one kind of thing, the same way if you said someone has an American accent, well, which kind, from which state? Are they from Boston? Are they from the South? The same way in England, if you say they have a British accent or an English accent, where are they from? Are they from the North? Are they from the South? And it's very much the same in South Africa, except that there are a couple more variables, I would say. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of accents in South Africa that range depending on race, on class, on geographical location, on culture, and so many other different things. And what comes along with that is due to South Africa's difficult history, um, the effects of that leak into every aspect of life in South Africa and language is no exception. So um, certain accents in South Africa are held in more prestige and are viewed as being more formal or just better in general, um, where certain other aspects are associated with all kinds of terrible things, lower intelligence, all kinds of terrible things. And obviously, generally, it is the white dialects that um, are seen with prestige very generally speaking. Um, and those are just impo important factors to take into account when we're talking about the South African accent. So when you're studying linguistics, uh, generally you deal with the um, general South African English accent. That's what it's called, Gen S-A-E, Gen Se, as I say, I don't know. And so let's talk about a couple of features. Um, one very important feature that comes up a lot is um, 
the schwa vowel. So that is the uh sound. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, we use it in place of the rhotic R at the end of a word, like in shorter, father, butter. We would say shorter, father, butter. And that uh, uh, uh sound at the end is the schwa. It also comes up in kind of all over the place. It's a very... Um, noticeable feature of the South African accent. Oh, by the way, I I get told every day, all day long, that I have a weird accent for a South African. Uh, there's not a day I don't have to um, explain to someone where I'm from, no, where are you really from, no, where are your grandparents from. I have a I have a bit of a atypical accent, uh, probably because I'm a neurodivergent person with a neurodivergent accent. Um, so please don't base your uh, knowledge or assumptions on the accent on me. <laughs> Moving on to another feature, which is monophthongization. Monophthongization? <laughs> I don't think I'm saying that right. But it is turning diphthongs into monophthongs. Once again, this is only an example of a feature that could come up in certain dialects, in certain accents um, in South Africa. So an example of that would be like um, in the word pi, there is a diphthong where you slide from I, you feel the vowel move, uh, whereas in certain South African dialects, you would just say pa. I'd like a pa. <laughs> um, there's two for you right in there. Uh, another one, another feature, uh, and this is related to, you know, the existence of so many different uh, accents and people groups and stuff like that in South Africa. So something related to that is if you were to ask a Iskosa speaking person, to pronounce the words bed, bird, and bad, they would say all three words the same way, uh, bed, bed, and bed. And the reason for that is that in the Isposa language, and I think quite a few others in South Africa, there are only five vowels that are used, and they're all short vowels, a, e, i, o, u, and so they don't use long vowels um, or I believe diphthongs or anything like that. And the unfortunate side effect of that is that once again, certain accents are looked down upon in South Africa and that is something that someone might be made fun of or um, have assumptions made about them. And this is just a reminder that just because someone doesn't say a word the same way that you do doesn't mean that they are less intelligent or that they are, they're you know, words are worthless. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. I hope that I've taught you something or that you found something interesting or that I made you curious to find out a little bit more. Anyway, have a nice day. Hi everyone, David here from speaklikedavid.com and I'm gonna be answering the question, where's your accent from? It's kind of complicated because I'm actually not a native English speaker. So I can't just say, oh, it's American or British or it's from this particular town or part of countries like that. Um, I'm actually Indian, um, but I was not born in India. I was born and raised in Brunei. That's a tiny country in Southeast Asia. But I don't have an Indian accent. I don't have a Brunei accent either. Um, and that goes back to how I actually learned English. From a very young age, I was immersed into the English language through TV shows. And I'm talking about shows like Sesame Street, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Bugs Bunny and the Looney Tunes. Um, Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, shows like that. And all the main characters in, in all of my favorite childhood TV shows were North American characters. They had, you know, different accents from various parts of North America. And that ended up being the strongest influence that I had. Um, these were my role models when it came to how to communicate in English. And so I ended up picking up a lot of the way they spoke. Now, I don't have what can strictly be called an American or, or Canadian accent um, because the education system in Brunei um, teaches British English. Brunei is a Commonwealth country and so I spell words the British way. I write color with a U. Um, I use words like rubbish and I still pronounce aluminium the right way um, as aluminium and not aluminum. So. It's probably most accurate to say that I have an international accent uh, because it is, in fact, the product of a whole range of different influences from across the globe. All right, there you have it. 11 different accents from people around the world. English, 
users. They use the language in their everyday life. And there were a couple of observations or things that I want to discuss that I found important in the video and I would like to share it with you. Culture. Did you notice that regardless of the accents of the individuals that were speaking, they did not leave their culture at the door? When they speak and use English, they bring their culture with them. And you, learner, you watching this video, you have the opportunity to do the same. There are some people that I know, they're from, let's say, William Land, right? And they're not from a native speaking English country. And they, they think they, you know, oh no, I can't bring, they can't bring their culture at the door. No, you bring your culture while learning English, right? So I really like how a lot of the speakers talked about the influence that culture has played in their lives. And it also plays a part in your life when learning English. So don't leave your culture at the door. I know they think I'm crazy. Am I crazy? I don't know. I'm not going to leave my culture at the door. I, I just not. Anyway, another point that I took that I found of value was when people were talking about the variety of English in terms of accent, in terms of dialects, the variety of English that you will hear around the world. It's very, very important. There are varieties of different accents around the world. And, you know, sometimes I've heard people say, oh, I don't like that particular accent. I don't like that particular variety of English. Well, maybe you don't like that particular variety or accent of English is because why? Your ear is not used to it. You haven't heard it before. So listen, variety, there's an old saying that we say in back in America, you might say in your country, variety is the spice of life. And variety is the spice of English. You might not like variety. You might want to put English in a particular box. Having English with no variety or wanting English to have one particular sound, one particular region, one particular accent, one particular color. You can do that. That's not reality. So variety of English is existent and you have the opportunity to listen to the different varieties of English. You might prefer one variety or one accent over another. That's fine. There's nothing to matter with preference, but please do yourself a favor and make sure that that preference does not necessarily turn into prejudice. I did a video on it. Another takeaway that I found really interesting was, in particular, when teacher uh, Dipika was talking about the aspect that English is not or should not, which I agree with her, English should not be monolithic. For those of you that don't know what monolithic means, uh, synonyms of the word would include rigid, inflexible, uniform. English is not a monolithic language. It's 2021. It's not. It's not monolithic. That does not mean that I cannot recognize the origin of the English language. Of course, history is important. But for those of you that are wanting to put English in a box, make it uniform, really? Okay, it's not monolithic. It's just like any other language in the world. It changes, it grows, it shapes, it moves, it develops. So English is not a monolithic language. And for those of you that are native speaker only and native speaker accent only, did I say it? I did. You can do that. That's your opinion. That's your belief. But again, that's not necessary reality. The other takeaway that I took that I found particularly interesting was when teacher Cleo mentioned the aspect of certain accents have an aspect of prestige or social status. And I thought that was really, really important that she said that. I don't necessarily, I've never been to South Africa, hopefully I will in the future, but I would make the argument when it comes to prestige or social status with respect to accent, that is not exclusive solely to uh, the country of South Africa. 
A lot of times people associate having a native speaking accent as a thing of prestige, as a thing of social status or being better than someone else. And so be mindful of that. If indeed, and I'm talking to those people out there that want to have a native speaking accent, if you want to do that for aspirational purposes, figure out which accent that you want, understand it takes months, years, shadow, copying, that's fine. You can have a native speaking aspect as something that is aspirational, something you strive for, something that is a goal, something that is a preference, no problem. But for those of you out there that are learners or content providers, yeah, I said it, that are only trying to, you know, um, fix native accent as the number one and everyone else out there is less than, please be mindful of that. Is that right? If English is a global international language, preference is one thing. I have no problem with anyone's preference, but in 2021, if I believe that native speakerism exists, then there's a very fine line between preference and prejudice that is sometimes explicitly said or implicitly said by either learners or content that is delivered. You know, when you hear learners or content providers saying, sound like a native, fix your accent. How about, again, content providers, you can do whatever you want. Learners, you have an opportunity. It is your choice. However, for me, how about instead of fixing your accent and sounding like a native, how about you speak naturally? How about you own the language with clarity and pronunciation and belief in yourself? But I digress, excuse me. I love the aspect that teacher Chloe talked about the aspect of having certain accents having a certain sense of prestige or social status. So those were the particular takeaways that I took from the video. I'm sure there were more, but at the moment I forgot them. Before I end this video, I want to give again a special thanks to Tom. Why? Um, I found this video to be extremely interesting, valuable, and important. Why? This video was a video um, that I have seen in a very long time that shows the diversity of English language and different accents. It shows the variety of different accents and it also shows the variety of people using the language. Did you notice that there were different genders, that there were different races, that there were different ethnicities in there? And that to me, representation is so, so important. It's not a question of being woke. It's not a question of being like, oh, having a particular message. No, English is a global international language. And typically when I've seen on YouTube and other social media applications, collaborations, I've typically only seen those content providers and those content providers have a choice to do and work with whom they want to, but I've only typically seen collaborations being done with, okay, we're gonna have a collaboration, let's hear the difference between British accent, English accent, Australian accent, and Canadian accent. Have you, is, am I the only one that's seen that or have you seen that as well? So I really want to say thank you, Tom, because someone who has been on YouTube as long as you have, someone, someone with the amount of followers, with the large number of followers that you have, I think that, you know, this type of video is really important because of your viewership, because of the influence that you have in the ESL market and on YouTube. This video is kind of important. Why? Because at least from my opinion, you're expanding the definition of what English can be, to whom it can be delivered to. You're possibly helping students think about that, oh yes, English has different accents, different varieties, and different regions and different colors. So thank you very much for that. I really, really appreciate that. And again, learners, at the end of the day, here's what I want you to realize. Representation becomes important. If you are speaking English and you do not see yourself on different social media applications or content, 
You have an opportunity to be that representation. You have an ability to what? If you don't have a seat, there's a metaphor that we use. If you don't have a seat at the table, you know what? Create your own seat because English is more than American or British or Canadian or South African or New Zealand or Irish. English is for you and for me. So you have a responsibility to be represented because English is not owned by any race, ethnicity, uh, color, religion, marital section. It is a global international language. English is a language. The language doesn't discriminate. It's people that discriminate. English does not exclude itself. It's native speakerism as an economic system of power and control that does that. So you look at this video and when you're feeling down and out, you have a seat at the table. And when people have the nerve or the audacity to make fun of your accent, and yes, I know that's real. People have made fun of my accent or the way that I, that I have spoken in the past. Listen, did that hurt in the past? Yes. But when I grew a pair, when I started having belief and confidence in myself, I realized what? Pay those people no mind. They are jealous, they are haters. And you know what? Sometimes not only can you pay them no mind and ignore them, but you know what? Put them in their place. Make them feel small. You're learning a, another language. You know another language other than English. You know your native language and English. And a lot of people out there only know their native language. So you know what you can do? Put them in their place. Keep on going. Keep on learning. This is Teach You Will. Welcome to the place where you and I learn together. That is my hope and my prayer. Click on that subscribe button, hit that bell notification so that when I drop a video, you are made aware of it. Let me know in the comments section what you think of this video. Again, Teacher Tom, thank you for doing the video. And I would encourage you learners out there, everyone that was featured in this particular video, go check their content out. You might learn from it. See you next time. Keep learning. Why? Because you are worth it.